Hi everyone, uh, my name is Anna. I run the Tool Library and the Redinger Cafe. Uh, I'm recording over the presentation we did over the summer since we have had a lot of requests from people that weren't able to attend because of the time that the meeting happened at their local community. So this is just going to be a quick overview of the presentation. Uh, it will be a little bit short and obviously we won't be able to have discussions while we as we did throughout the presentations over the summer. Uh, but I hope that this at least gave you some sort of uh, enlightenment what the Redinger Cafe is about and what we're aiming to do with this project. So I'm just going to start. My name is Anna, like I said before, and I'm originally from Brazil. Uh, my background is in conservation restoration, focusing in preventive conservation. Um, I moved twice in 2017 and I started the Tool Library and the Redinger Cafe the following year. Um, I started those projects because I was lacking tools and I needed them and unfortunately I didn't know enough people around Reykjavik and Iceland that were able to uh, lend me those tools and when I looked into access to tools it was either buying or renting and the renting cost was almost as expensive as buying. So I thought there must be a different alternative to this and I found out about um, the tool library system. Uh, which is all over the world. And I thought maybe we should start one here in Iceland. Um, I met the guys from Toronto Tool Library and they inspired me and opened this whole world of circular economy to me. So what is circular economy? So right now we live in what some consider linear economy, which is where we get things, we buy things, we use them and then we throw them away. Um, I would um, say that we probably live more on a recycling economy um, because we are already dealing with waste management. A lot of the focus uh, going into dealing into this right now, especially in the governmental um, entities. Uh, but what we really want is a circle economy, is an economy that designs out waste and pollution, is an economy that keeps the materials that we gather from nature into the circular system and by that allows the natural systems to regenerate themselves um, and give time to nature to cure itself before we take more out of it and also you know it's, it's a lot of waste from our side to just use metals and things that can be repliable and reusable without the con the conscious of using it again so the concept of a circular design is pretty important I'm going to show you a little video of a circular economy and what it is. Um, hope you enjoyed and then we'll continue the presentation from there. Many of the things we need come from nature. A precious metal like gold is mined from the earth. Then it is taken to a factory where it might end up in a phone. The phone is used until a new phone comes out and the old one is thrown away. But where does it go? Either it goes to landfill or it is burned. There are three stages. Take, make and waste. And we have been doing this for over 200 years, ever since we were able to mass produce things in factories. The trouble is, we don't have an endless supply of materials such as gold that we can use up and throw away. And we can't keep harming the planet with all the waste and pollution that we create. This planet is our only home. So what could we do differently? What if we repaired the phone when it broke? What if we reused it when we no longer wanted it? What if we remade it when it was no longer repairable? What if we recycled the gold and other materials inside so that they could be used to make brand new phones? The phone could live, then die, then its parts could give life to a new phone, a cycle inspired by nature. In nature, waste is always used to make something else, again, and again. Now let's take an orange. The orange grows and is harvested by a farmer. 
the orange is taken to a store where somebody buys it. That person eats the orange and throws away the peel. Like the materials inside the phone, the nutrients inside the peel are lost. So what could we do differently? Did you know that orange peel can be turned into fibre that can be used to make clothes? What if we turned the peel into a gas to produce energy? What if we composted the peel and returned the nutrients to farmland to grow more oranges? By keeping products and materials in these cycles, we could create a system that puts back more than it takes and nothing is wasted, allowing the earth to regenerate while giving us the things we need to live. Finally, imagine all of this was powered by renewable energy. It is called the circular economy and it is happening right now. But this isn't just about mobile phones and oranges. Look around you. Imagine if everything was designed from the beginning to fit in these cycles. There would be no such thing as waste or pollution, so nature and wildlife could thrive. When we see the world as a blank canvas, the possibilities are endless. All right, so this is a little bit about circular economy by the guys from Ellen McCartney Foundation. They are in the forefront of circular economy and I'll link this video below as well. So as well as circular economy, we try to target the SDGs, which is the Sustainable Development Goals uh, from the UN. And we tackle four directly goals. Um, the industry innovation and infrastructure goals, we do that by offering people access to the tool library. We tackle the sustainable cities and communities as well by having the tool library, but also by having the repair cafe events or adding a cafe like we call them nowadays. And we tackle 12 uh, with responsible consumption. So obviously by giving people the alternative to borrow things rather than um, buy new, it's a uh, is a responsible consumption act, as well as repairing things rather than throwing them away. Um, and by tackling those three, we actually tackle um, 13, which is the climate action, um, which means that um, we, we're you know, actively bringing awareness into um, you know, climate action by offering people alternatives and active ways where they can tackle climate change. So we are also uh, the official representatives for the right to repair movement in the EU. Um, we um, believe that people should have access to repair, which is something that we think is very common sense because in the older generations, everyone used to repair everything, especially in an island community like ours, people would think that it's repairing is always the first option, but turns out that it tends not to be. So I'm going to show two little videos, one about plan obsolescence and the next one about what is happening right now in the EU. We'll also link those below if you want to jump those ahead. Planned obsolescence? It's gone too far. Mystery screws, too much glue, parts that are hard to find, too expensive or non-replaceable. And there are even legal barriers. The system is rigged to stop us fixing our stuff. We need yeah. a universal right to repair for all consumers and repairers. Products should last longer and be repairable by design. Fixing a product with a simple fault shouldn't cost more than buying a new one. Spare parts and repair manuals should be accessible to everyone for the entire lifetime of a product. And when we win at the point of purchase, we'll see scores on whether a product can be repaired or not. And with that ability to choose longer lasting products, we'll fix things. So the idea is, is very common sense and we tend to think that, you know, it can be quite overwhelming to dealing with all of this. 
but there is actually things happening in the EU that could be applied into Iceland. Uh, we are a little bit behind compared to the other Nordic countries. And I'll show you on the next video, which um, we'll talk a little bit about. Pushing for repairable products and waste prevention is about a lot more than what has decided in Brussels. Much is happening across Europe at local and national level. For example, in Sweden, people can get tax breaks for appliance repairs done in their homes by technicians. Similarly, residents of the Austrian city of Graz can apply for small grants covering 50% of the labour cost of repairs. In France from 2021, shoppers will be able to compare the repairability score of some electrical products when buying in stores and online. In Norway, most consumer electronic products already come with a five-year warranty. And there is more proposed legislation that needs our support in the UK and Italy. In the UK, there are plans to require manufacturers of connected products to state the minimum duration of software support. And in Italy, a proposed planned obsolescence law would ensure spare parts are available for products and that they are reasonably priced. This is just the beginning. Help us spread the right to repair across Europe by pushing for better legislation at local, national and EU level. So, as you can see, there are plenty of things that we can be doing um, and pushing our government to be changing in the laws. At the moment, uh, we are lobbying to reduce VAT on parts. So when you buy parts from abroad, you can actually um, not pay for the taxation on it, as well as we're trying to get people there offer repair as, um, as a business for them to not have to charge VAT so they don't have to pay VAT themselves. Because right now there's a lot of times you go to get something repaired and it's as expensive as buying new and a lot of people would choose to buy new. Um, so because of that, we kind of expect um, to have some level of change in the government in the next few years. So from those two concepts, well, three with the SDGs, um, that's how the tool library and the Reininger Cafe came about. And those two projects are very much community focused and we really want to help people to have access to things and to have the rights over their own things. Because for example, when for example, you have an iPhone, your iPhone breaks, the only people you can take this to get repaired is, is Apple, which tends to mean that they own the phone. Uh, <laughs> since you don't have the right to get it repaired to anyone else, you have to repair with them. Um, and um, a little bit different um, when it comes to, to uh, accessibility as well with tools and things like that. We started the tool library with just tools, but now we have camping gear, we have projectors, we have tents, um, event tents, we have like, coffee machines for events and things like that because people just need access for things and they shouldn't really have to be paying a premium for something they're going to use for a couple of hours every now and then. Um, so that's how it began. So the tool library, um, actually those that data that is, I'm showing right now is not really correct. There is actually 305 members now and 125 active members. Um, and we have 875 items in the system, although some of them broke recently, but luckily we've been able to replace, so we're back on 375 items. And we have had 1,500, uh, and actually we actually had 1,815 borrows since this presentation was created. So we had 200 new borrows since July, which is pretty amazing. Uh, we had, I think, 400 and... Uh, 484 items borrowed during the CERMA uh, since the beginning of the CERMA, which is fantastic. And through the Redinger Cafe, we have kept 881 kilograms of materials from gone to landfills. Um, the reason we can call ourselves the first ever fully circular project in Reykjavik is because we haven't bought any of the items. All the 875 items we have available have been donated so really when you buy a membership, the only thing your membership pays for is the storage 
and the person managing the software for you to organize it. Um, so we, uh, we, we aim for no profitability whatsoever. Um, the Repair Cafe movement actually is, uh, started in Amsterdam. I met the Repair Cafe movement when I went to Toronto and that was a fascinating idea to me that people, local people, uh, people they are retired and you know who haven't got, uh, got much to do anymore. They don't have jobs. They they but they still have so much skill to share with that they would just take charge and do those repair events where they repair things for people for free. So that was really fascinating to me. Um, the main difference between what we are trying to do and the um, and the Repair Cafe movement, the reason we changed our name is because they were quite structured and focused on repairability, where we want to be more structured and focused on awareness. We want our local community to go to a repair person and get things repaired. They don't, we don't want them to count on us to repair things for them, but we want to show them that there is an option to repair. So a lot of the things that we do is not only repair, but we do assessments. So what is broken, what parts they need to buy, how it can be repaired, who can repair it for them, and so on. Um, we have had a lot of events in the last years, and these are some pictures from the events we had. We have um, amazing volunteers. We have a solid group of 10 volunteers that are always there. And then we have, I think, total 36 volunteers that come and go. Um, and the events are really, really great. And um, during COVID, it was very difficult. We weren't able to do any events. Uh, but it's really nice to be able to do them now. So this is uh, some cool data that we have. We have officially repaired 155 items in the last three years, um, but that saved 9,115 kilograms of CO2 emissions from being created. Um, we have still created 1,290 kilograms, and that's uh, from repairing, from buying parts and replacing parts. But that's, that's a lot of CO2 emissions saved. Um, we, and we also have saved 881 kilograms from going, going to landfills. We hope that by spreading the project around Iceland, the uh, local communities can also have an impact and you know, repair as much as they want and they can and be able to add to this. So right now with the amount of CO2 emissions we have saved, you can go around the ring road 48 times or three, 37,855 miles, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, why join the Reading Cafe? So this is a lot of information there. You're welcome to pause it and read it. Um, but basically, I feel that the reason we should do those events is to establish a community sense that we need to repair things and that there is an alternative for throwing away. And if you don't have a use to an item anymore, you can pass it on to someone else or you can take it apart and use the parts to repair the items that are available to the community. The whole aim of this project is to give the community a sense of power when it comes to waste management and to have, you know, a make a conscious decision to choose to repair rather than buy new when you don't have to. Um, so we are really trying to reduce the obstacles between people being able to repair and see it repairing as a positive thing. Um, so how to start? Um, we created a Facebook group where we're going to make available to all the volunteers around Iceland. We want to make this um, all together rather than individual locations. The reason for that is because we have a lot of volunteers that come and go and some volunteers change cities and they're able to maybe come to your local repair cafe event if you're running it. Um, so that's why we want to keep it all together in one location. We will help you contact your local community places for hosting the event, so libraries, fab labs, schools, and so on. Um, there is, um, you know, we, we normally organize ourselves in three teams. So you have the organizational team, which is the team that organized the event itself. Then you have the support team, which is of volunteers that don't particularly have any repair skills, but they want to participate. So they come and they help us making coffee and meeting people and greeting people and have a nice conversation with the people that are coming to the events. And then we have the repair team, which offer different types of repairs, 
depending on people's skills and availability. Um, we will support you. We created this super cool package, which we're going to be sending soon, um, which includes all the documentation you need for running your events. Um, you will also have access to our website. We will be promoting the events locally on the website. We created a sign-up page where every single location that we've been to the event can add their, um, their location to the volunteer sign-up. And then we can redirect the volunteers to your area and to the main contact, main organization person for the local community. Um, and we have also the manual we translated and everything's available in Icelandic, not only in English. So we hope that will give people a lot of access. Um, in October, we're going to be going around again. We will be taking some of our volunteers to support the local organizers. So if you can find someone to do clothing repair for your event, just give us a shout. I'm going to try and find someone from our volunteer pool to come with us. Um, and this way, we want to establish the first event in October, and we want to let people take it on. There is no real structure. When it comes to repair cafe events, they are generally quite structured, where with us, I think every different community has a different way of working. And what works in Reykjavik doesn't mean that it's going to work in Seydesjörd or Izefjörd and so on. So we want people to really adapt this to their communities. And we have no issues with you using our logos and our information for that. And in November, in the end of November, we're going to have a small conference. There is also going to be a hackathon. And the conference will be about the right to repair movement and circular economy. We're also going to be talking about projects that are happening right now in Iceland. And we'll um, create a hackathon to try and go carbon neutral by 2040. So this is going to be a, a really cool event in the end of November. So thank you for listening to me talk over this presentation. You're welcome to um, join us whenever you like. Uh, send us an email. Uh, Sandra is organizing uh, the, the Riding a Cafe tour. So email her, uh, Sandra at munisap.punteres. Uh, um, and you can also email me if you want, Anna at munisap. Um, and I hope to hear from you guys soon. So thank you very much, guys, um, and uh, talk soon. <laughs>